Okay. Hi, Pauline. Thank you so much for coming. Um, so everyone, I'd like to welcome Pauline Lawson today. And um, Pauline, I'm sure you can uh, introduce yourself yeah. far better than I can. So please, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yes, thank you for having me. It's lovely to be here. Um, so yeah, I am Pauline and I am the owner of a, a small business here in Midlothian near Edinburgh um, uh, called Emotional Coaching and Wellbeing. But obviously I haven't always done that. So I'll go backwards a little bit and just give you my my sort of background and then come back to the business that I run today. Um, because, um, yeah, for 25 years, approximately 25 years, give or take, I was a teacher. Um, I trained to be a teacher. I worked in both primary and secondary education. And it, I've, in my early years in education, I um, worked in schools that had, you know, quite a mix, quite a diverse mix within the school and there was a lot of I suppose what they would call at the time behavior issues um not a word I'm, I'm fond of but lots of behavior issues and I just followed suit with what was going on round about me of how schools dealt with behavior issues and I knew it was kind of didn't sit with me very well but I didn't know how to change it or do something different with it and I felt like we were in a game of whack-a-mole just behaviors like this so my very early in my career, I decided I need, I need to do something different here because it's not sitting well with me, my own values and my own beliefs. But I didn't know what, how to change it. I researched, I trained, I did loads of extra training and things like that to become and I changed jobs a lot to become the behavior management teacher or, you know, inclusion and well-being teacher, various titles they give you over the years. Um, but basically it was children that were naughty, children that were different, children that were, you know, someone saw as different and I would try to um, support them into back into their, their their settings or their schools, whether that be special needs or, you know, mainstream settings. And I realised that all behaviours through training, through practice, are driven by emotion. And I think that's why I got heavily hooked into, if I could teach these kids all about their emotions then when they pop up in ways that, you know, we, society, them, are, don't find very pleasing, then we, um, then they, they can know how to work with them as rather than against them. So I quickly became the emotions lady. Um, I would go into schools and go, oh, the emotions lady's in today. Um, and that would be the kids and the staff. But it became my, my passion to learn about emotions and teach children about emotions and teach parents about emotions and teach teachers about emotions so that when anyone struggled, we could help them weave their way through it. And that became my job in any different title or guys, you know, whatever title they gave me over the years, I became that teacher who had titles, silly things, even like the child whisperer. If there's a child on the roof, we know who to call. It's all, it, was, it became, became a little bit silly. Um, however, budget cuts, changes, they want you back in the classroom, back in the classroom. And I used to always think, where's my poor wee souls that live with adversity? Who's looking after them? And I'd be back in the classroom and I'd be back managing a school. Um, so eventually I decided this isn't really working for me. These kids need help. They still exist in some way, shape or form. I just can't get to them because I'm in a classroom, maybe in a mainstream school or being a deputy head teacher in a mainstream school. And I knew those kids were out there somewhere. And I thought I'm going to go out there and find them and reach them. Um, so my business is basically what I would have loved to do, what I have done in schools, but not always allowed to do it because the system's kind of broken in a sense and it didn't align with my values. So off I went to do this. Wonderful. So what I'd love to know is like what a typical like week might look like, you know, um, yeah. Lovely. So yeah, I mean, I have my little business and to start off with, it was very small and I would go into little church halls and I'd run classes because I like to be proactive teaching all the kids before the big moments happen. But then I would do one-to-ones because some kids have very different ways of operating and maybe need that smaller group or one-to-one. -one. Um, so I'd go into people's houses and that was wonderful. Um, but then I realised, and now I've got this space here that you can see all my mess and things in the background because it's very interactive, the stuff that I do. So I have little toys and games and books um, to sort of we weave that in. So yeah, now I'm here. And that's helped me over the past sort of five years or so establish myself as a, you know, a business. So I go into schools. Let's just say, you know, Monday, Tuesday, eh, not Monday, because I I take my Monday as a day to plan the week ahead because I've got lots of things to organise. Um, so don't say a day off, but 
you know, one of those days where you think, oh, I've got heaps of admin and things to do. But on typically right now, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, I'm actually back in schools, which is lovely because I'm not in charge of the school. They have to find the budget to pay me. I don't have to get involved in the politics and stuff. Um, and the teachers that invite me and the schools that invite me in must want me rather than me being plopped in. Um, so it's great because I get to do groups, classes. I've done in-service days with them. Um, and it's people that want to learn more about this and go, oh, that makes sense. There are some people in schools that are like, well, not my thing. Uh, and that's fine. But I only go now to places where they've invited me in. Mm -hmm. um, you, then, have, you can tell in Pauline that you love what you do. It's, oh, it's yeah. really to hear the passion. Yeah. Um, I would, you know, maybe a bit of a big question, but for the families that are watching this, you know, mm. some of your like top tips or the things that people ask you the most. Yeah. What do people ask you? And well, I think the things that come up are um it's Anger. Do you know, people are always worried about anger, you know, because children that are frustrated, annoyed, upset, it often comes out to us, to the, you know, the, the outlooker. We're looking at this poor soul and it looks like anger to us. And um, so parents will say he or she is always angry or schools will say he or she is always angry. What can we do for them? What can we do to support them? Um, so that's always a biggie. I don't know if that's, you know, things that you've probably heard before. Do you know, it's these... And I always think, well, is it anger? Is it anger? Because anger is this, and I think the first thing as a parent, the top tips for parents, I say to them, and just the first call I would have with them, and I go, that 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 sounds hard, but is it? If anger wasn't in our vocabulary and we took it away and we really looked more curiously, is it something else? Mm -hmm. Because as a society, we've coupled anger, the word, the emotion with behaviors mm -hmm. aggression shouting yelling these types of things and actually i sometimes get angry and i just want to lie under my duvet and hide and there are other ways and maybe the child is not angry maybe they're frustrated maybe they're annoyed and I always think if we step away from the anger then our empathy kicks in a little bit and goes ah maybe they're scared or oh maybe they're upset but mm -hmm. when we go for anger it's such a high level emotion that we get we get worked up about it too we we become angry mm -hmm. so language i think is important mm. so important is it anger and that's fine if it is maybe it is maybe it's not um but i think um our kids as well need to know i think society as well there's lots of books and things out there anger is like this volcano anger is red and then we teach our kids that anger is wrong and that's really sad for me that they go through life thinking anger is wrong because if that wee lad or that wee girl grows up into a teenager, grows up into a young adult and thinks, oh, I'm not allowed to be angry, I sometimes want them to be angry. But what I want to teach them is how to use that anger in a helpful and healthy way for all, all concerned, but themselves mainly. But mm -hmm. if something happens to them, I want them to be a little bit angry about it. That's where their passion comes from. That's where their drive comes from. Or that's where their protective factors come from. And if we take anger away from them because it's a bad thing while they're young, then we're struggling later on in life. Um, but I go, as I said, right, the start when I was introducing myself, I love to go upstream and teach them about their emotions, not about anger specifically, but about the solution, which is regulation. Mm -hmm. Calming that sort of fight or flight part of the brain down and accessing our sort of prefrontal part of the brain. But if a kid doesn't know that, then I can't take them there during the big emotion, whatever it may so be. If So let's say a parent comes to you and it is about anger. That's what they've come to you about. So are you saying the way you, so obviously you, you'll explain how you work with the parent, but then you're saying you don't then focus on the anger. You you focus on all emotions and helping the child. How would you explain it? What, what do you kind of do with obviously it depends on age but how do you work with children is a bit of a, an idea yeah because yeah, absolutely and i'll say to them well i'll focus on the solutions rather than the problem so you were giving our kids a bucket full of solutions and maybe strategies but initially the knowledge and i tend to go for teaching the kids about their brain because then there's no shame or blame there it's biology do you know you're thinking oh i've got a fight or flight now with little kids i happen to have them here because they're always lying around 
I teach kids about these three parts of their brain. Now, there's heaps of analogies and heaps of books and heaps of psychologists. I've just plumped on these three. Some people use monkeys and there's various different ones. But I tend to refer to that fight or flight part of the brain as a meerkat because it's always hypervigilant looking out. Mm -hmm. Now, we know that some kids' meerkats are hypervigilant and some kids' meerkats are maybe just triggered now and again. But if it's triggered, you know, we need to learn to soothe it. It also helps give our kids like that responsibility because they almost think, I've got to calm my meerkat down. Mm -hmm. It's not unheard of for a 14-year-old boy to say to me, when I've worked with them when they're younger, maybe in school, and then we've gone to high school, his meerkat's triggered because he couldn't remember any of the science words mm -hmm. but he knew his meerkat was triggered and he needed to come and see miss lawson mm -hmm. that that was this ugh. so if i teach young children that they know they've got their little amygdala but they also know which empowers them more they've got their thinking brain their wise brain their prefrontal cortex mm -hmm. so they've got their owl brain and sometimes i can just quite simply say to a child who's having just a little meerkat moment or maybe a medium that what's your owl thinking right now? What's your owl doing? And even just this tap that teachers will maybe do or parents will do is enough to get a child to go, oh yeah, and get these two guys to work together. The math test is scary or the fight at break time wasn't pleasant, but we're talking to their owl rather than their meerkat. Mm -hmm. And as a parent, your mission is always, and I think when your kid's having that big emotion, your job right now is nothing else but to get that meerkat from unsafe to safe. That's our only job. Mm -hmm. And it's what I'm, and I say to myself sometimes, is what I'm about to say going to help that meerkat? Because if it's not, don't say it or don't do it. Do you know those types of things? So bring the meerkat down. Then you can speak to the owl a little bit, what's going on, sort of situation. But I never speak to a meerkat because, you know, pointless. Third mm -hmm. part is their elephant brain, which is their memory banks, mm -hmm. this hippocampus part of their brain. So that's where I teach them lots of strategies and lots of practices so that they're there ready to aid the calming sort of process. So that's where we put all that. And I have neurons and things that we talk about as well. So if a child knows all that, it makes the conversation much easier between a parent and a child when a anger or a big emotion, whatever it may be, is happening so therefore we'd never need to demonize the anger it's just like whoa meerkat said uh, doing a really good job today maybe too big a job too good a job mm -hmm. we need to bring him down mm -hmm. what can we do to bring him down and i've had parents come back to me and say it's totally changed the way i speak about emotions because we're talking about meerkats and owls and if they want the science obviously there's amygdalas and there's prefrontal cortexes and there's hippocampus but mm -hmm. a lot of the kids really when they're in a fight or flight state they'll hang on to the meerkat. Oh, I love this. I really love it. And I think, you know, what what I'm seeing, Pauline, in terms of how I work is um, I'm all about um, the strategies. That's a lot of what I do is the strategies, And a lot of them are physical body strategies. But actually, there's this piece, and, and you're kind of the piece, um, this piece about the understanding piece yeah. um, that you know, it's, it's really important, isn't it? Can, can you talk about some of your strategies? Because I think we'll have strategies in common, but because I'm a very like physical sensory specialist and, and you, you know, um, I think so we'll have things like breathing and things in common, but I'd love to hear your strategies, some of them. I mean, it is kind of similar because when I left, I went off to become a mindfulness coach. I thought I'll train in that. Oh, I'll, I'll train in yoga. And, you know, because I do Feel, know that I want them to learn about their nervous system and I want them to sort of close the end of an emotion um, but so it is physical so it probably is very similar but I will teach them every week to do that belly breathing when they come along to me for sessions but I'm always telling them that we're developing a habit and putting it inside our elephant brain so it's in a little filing cabinet I do um, you know and I'll use big Hoberman spheres and things to demonstrate the breathing but it's not unheard of us for just to even just to, because some kids are more physical, it's doing five star jumps. But those five star jumps have a purpose because they're getting that emotion because an emotion has a beginning, a middle and an end. So mm. it's more hooking amazing strategies like you have and hooking them back to the learning so it has a purpose. Mm -hmm. And I do a lot of um, making. We do lots of crafts. Mm -hmm. So I think something as well, even just the mindful colouring in or these types of things that we'll use as a strategy, 
-hmm. because it's in their elephant brain again that that's one that works for them mm -hmm. so it, i mean i think they're probably the same things you know you'll do lots of big things with big um, a big a movement but some kids are not into that some kids want to sit down and i do have a whole box here which a lot of kids then go off to buy of massage tools mm-hmm just simple ones like we would buy in TK Maxx when they're on the shelf, these rollers yeah. um, or ones that buzz from Ikea. So they're buzzing that emotion out the way. It's like got a beginner. Uh, yeah, I, I talk because vibration is the most intense form of tactile input and it's also stimulating the proprioceptive system. So you kind of got two ticks in two boxes for dampening down that over responsivity. So in fact, I was doing some parent training last night and I said, if you've already got like a little fidget box of all little sensory toys, make sure you add vibration in because vibrations are, are really, are really good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the box comes out every so often. Um, the box will come out and they'll they'll practice it and work out which ones they really like. Because I'm yeah. allowed to do that. I'm not a specialist in your area. And I'm thinking, well, you use which one works for you. So then they'll maybe, I'll let their mums know if we're doing it in one-to-one. -one. Sometimes they'll go and purchase them or something similar that creates that same. And maybe they are working with an amazing occupational therapist too, which will back that up. And for me, it's just for their mum to say, well, if you've got that big meerkat moment, why don't you get through it? Use some of your tools. Yeah. So that's when they... I suppose my purpose is to go, ah, I'm going to get myself through that emotion in a way that works for me rather than me telling them. Of course, I sprinkle in. Yeah. Things. So, Pauline, if um, if the pair, if my pair, my parents, but if the parents I work with, you know, want to know more about this, do you do like group parent sessions or would they contact you for one to one support? Do you do like training or is it one to one type? Support. yeah i haven't done any, i haven't done so far but my everything's always moving and evolving um if i'm working one-to-one -one with a child i um always have a, that discovery call and sometimes parents couple that with additional coaching parents so we weave the two together because mm -hmm. there'll be a child package which has little elements of working with the parents mm -hmm. but then i've got parent coaching where the parents realize they need some stuff and they couple the two a coaching parent coaching and a child coaching and we weave it together but i haven't had the the need for group coaching but that doesn't mean it couldn't ever happen okay my children that come to my proactive groups every single week every single week i come online and share the general learning because it's not for one child it's for 10 of them mm -hmm. so i've chosen a theme Last month, we were studying perfectionism. Lots of the kids had these perfectionist tendencies. I had loads of crafts and activities to challenge these perfectionist tendencies. And in between, every second week, I come online to my parent group and share the learning from within the class mm -hmm. so that a child can, a parent can use the same vocabulary. Right. Okay. So, so would parents potentially, you know, how we we use the example of a parent would might come to you and say, you know, we need help with this anger issue. Do they come with things like self esteem and perfectionism and Absolutely. anxiety? Do you want to talk about those kind of things a little? Yeah. I mean, they'll come along with shy, and my child is shy, or my child's lacking in confidence, or they're moving to high school and you know a different high school friendship groups, all the normal. Mm -hmm. It's, and, and that's not to minimise these issues because they're hard for that child in that moment. They are, they're mm -hmm. awful and they're hard and depending on their own adversities that they've got going on in their life previously or conditions, diagnosis, all these types of things. But I often say to parents, and it's similar to the anger, and I go, ah, if you, your child can come here, that's amazing, but I'm not going to go. I've had a chat with your mum and she's written me a list of all the things. I'm always going to go upstream. I'm always going to go upstream. I'm going to teach them about these in a more age, well, whatever age appropriate way. I've got different ones for teenagers. Um, and I always think if I teach them about their neuroscience, if I teach them about their nervous system, if I teach them about closing an emotion, that beginning, middle and end, and then somehow they'll maybe say, and I'll say, is this kind of thing happening in your life? And they'll tell me about the mean girls in the class. But I'm not going to go in overtly talking about mean girls in the class or even saying confidence or lacking in confidence or identity because they're going to immediately feel a deficit in their lives. And I think I'm not going there. I'm not going to add to that deficit. I've mm -hmm. actually coached a young girl recently. I knew the context because her mum had told me. 
she didn't want to share the context. And I said, you know this, it doesn't matter. Because when I was talking about maybe unhelpful thinking habits or going through some scenarios, and I said, have you got your thing in your head just now? Yep, that's fine. And I said, so this might fit it. And we would discuss something and she would go, yep, that works. I'm going to try that for my homework. So I didn't even need to know the thing. Mm. It was her thing just now because it's all sort of proactive and that's why I'm an educator as opposed to I'm trained as a counsellor I choose not to be a counsellor because you've got to nod quite a lot at children in a in a sense of it's all in, it's non-directive and I totally get that but there's sometimes I'm sitting there with an eight-year-old or a 12-year-old in front of me and I think I've got a piece of information you need so I'm mm -hmm. going to give you that. I'm not going to tell you. It's not directive. But it's a bit like telling them their times tables and then they can go off and use them in life. I'm going to tell them these tools and then they go off and use them in their life. And what I love and makes me really excited listening to you, Pauline, is just how empowering it is. And, and that you're, you know, I, I feel like there's some services out there um, and the, they're well-meaning, like, you know, well-meaning, but they almost give this message to children that they're broken and need fixing. Yeah. And I've really struggled with that, you know, um, over the, especially um, with what's gone on for one of my children. And I've, I've not wanted to send him on courses that, that, that like school has suggested to sending on because I felt like sending him on one of these courses is like, he's got a problem. He needs to go on a course to, to fix himself. So I love this idea that you're just educating the child, giving them knowledge and that they, that they can, you know, use. Reality test. The reality test it in their real life. I can't do that bit, but we'll sit here and they'll maybe come up with a goal. They'll maybe share something with me because we've built a relationship by then. Maybe they won't. Like this wee girl, her thing was too personal for, for sharing out loud out of her mouth, but it didn't matter because, yeah, I'm just scaffolding them, giving mm -hmm. them something to go off and try in their life. And I think you're absolutely right because why would I give anyone a deficit? They're already mm -hmm. probably feeling it themselves. Somebody's mentioned it their friends or teachers or their parents or grandparents. And you think, I'm not going there. I'm not going to add. I'm mm -hmm. going to build up. Yes. And rather than anything. And I was in a school last week and speaking to the teacher and the head teacher is talking about budgets. And she goes, why don't you take some groups? And I says, can I not just do that to the whole class? Mm -hmm. I know who your targeted children are. Give me their names and I'll give mm -hmm. them photos and I'll know who I need to put a little bit more emphasis on. But as soon as you take those children out, it sets a prophecy right. um, that I'm not willing to be part of. And the teachers are like, yeah, fine, you're just going for the whole class. And I'll know the target of children. The teacher knows the target of children. And we can weave that in because that's our that's our that's our superpower. That's our training. But the children don't need to know anyone's any different. And actually, someone may be going through adversity in two weeks time or six months time and think, oh, that makes sense. And actually that links with something that when you were speaking earlier, I didn't want to interrupt you, but something that came to my mind was, um, this is going to sound really random now, a link with sex education. I thought, you know how sex education is compulsory and it's like, you know, taught. I thought this needs to be like the equivalent, you know, like it should, it, it, and, and this is just like, um, you know, idealistic type thinking. Yeah. And I know you and I just sat here, you know, we're not going to change the whole education system and change the world, but we can try our best. And I just think that just like you have to teach certain things like sex education, then this emotional literacy or um, whatever the terminology is, should just be taught to everyone in schools because we'd have healthier adults and we'd have better politicians Proactive. running the Proactive. country. Proactive. That's what it always is, isn't it? Of course I get children brought to me in that reactive sense when people mm -hmm. are worried, but I just really want, that's why I do my regular classes on a Tuesday night. I have a bunch of little kids in here and kind of fun and making things, but there's always serious piece of learning. I have kids in on a Friday night and, you know, and, and I have a little Lego group and it's nothing to do with the Lego. It's just mm -hmm. an, a vehicle for teaching the other stuff. And yeah. I am based in Scotland and we have the curriculum for excellence and actually all this stuff's in it. Mm -hmm. It's just the the poor relative of the literacy and the numeracy, numeracy and these types of subjects that society deem as more important. So it just slides under the radar. Mm -hmm. And that's why I always go in and I say to schools, well, I can come in and bring your health and wellbeing curriculum to life mm -hmm. just with a few wee 
things and little tools and neurons and growth mindset and mm -hmm. all these types of things where kids go, mm, when you're going to teach them about it, if it's so dry. But when I go in, I feel like a celebrity in school. Last week I was in, I was like a celeb going up and down one of the atriums. I was like, Miss Lawson. And you just, like, <laughs> just brought a bit of fun and the, yeah. I bring a breathe poster and they know what a way to do a breathe lesson because that's how I, the yeah. model that I use to teach. So, um, and we had a little chat before I hit record and I would like to capture um, something that I asked you because most of the families I work with um, have children who are neurodivergent. Um, and I had asked you whether there's any differences in how you approach things with neurodivergent children. So yeah, I mean, I've worked in education in special needs, in a special needs school. I also worked in uh, mainstream schools but as we know, with the whole presumption of mainstreaming and stuff going on, there's a lot of kids in mainstreams that, you know, quite rightly or wrongly, that's not something we're going to chat about today because we'll be here all day. <laughs> but it made me a, an inclusion teacher because sometimes I was given the most diverse groups from kids from care and um, kids with different diagnosis, kids without a diagnosis or kids that really came from adverse backgrounds. So I think I always, without knowing it at the time, there wasn't so much out there training and information that you go, oh, oh, and you just had to create a family. So I just think I've always been really inclusive and that means that I do adapt it, but maybe naturally, like too natural that I hardly notice now and again. But I'm well aware, you know, more training and stuff over the years that I have to say this in a specific way or or do things in a certain way. But it's more about to suit the child than a diagnosis. Mm -hmm. you don't suit the child. But I always do think as well, I go back to basics with a lot of them and say, but you still have a mere cat and an owl and an elephant. Mm hmm whether they want to call it the amygdala or the whatever more scientific names, but they still have those. Now it's harder work for some of us to tap into our owl. It's harder work. This this hypervigilant kind of meerkat is more hypervigilant for some kids than others. So I will say to them, it's harder work for you to calm it down. I get that. But for some of us, it's harder work to do math. So, so try to normalize it for them. It's hard for me to ride a bike. Do you know these types of things? Mm -hmm. so I find that it's a like a challenge that they can overcome rather than anyone being labelled or again putting any deficit on anyone mm -hmm. yeah and I think that's how I work in a, in a sense I have a studio here and I have a wee lads that come in maybe with their ear defenders and maybe more overtly showing their their style um and I will I not only I'm inclusive but we teach inclusion as well do you know and and, and you see the kids sort of supporting each other and I've had kids that are, you know, maybe selective mutes. And I think, well, I never knew there was selective mute because I can't shut them up. It, so there must be something there that we're allowing to open that. And that, I suppose that's my classroom experience of 25 years and also bringing it into my, mm -hmm. my career. And when you were saying, though, um, the part about, you know, you've still got a meerkat, they just might be having to work a little bit harder um, because um, you're... There you are. Um, because, you know, maybe you have to work a bit harder because this particular child's meerkat's, you know, a bit more hypervigilant. Um, I can imagine some parents might be thinking, if that's my child now, you know, my child's, let, let's say a parent's got a six-year-old and their meerkat is really like, whoa. I imagine parents will be saying, are they always going to be like that? Is, are they going to, and they're just always going to have to have strategies even as an adult or can, is that going to like improve? You would hope it would, wouldn't it? Because, I mean, we know with growth mindset and all the research around growth mindset that we can change our habits. And sometimes I refer to them as habits. Mm -hmm. Not in a, in a detrimental kind of way, because I get there's some people's wiring and the way they are. But I think some of them are still habits, the way we do things, like brushing our teeth habits rather than a, you know, a bad habit of biting our nails. But our habits that our brain functions on. And that's why I teach them about neurons. Because mm -hmm. we can change our neurons around. And I think if the kids know that, then they know that inside their head, they've got neurons that hold tight sometimes to other neurons and create a pathway. But they know that they're in charge of all the pathways. So by doing something more and more, mm -hmm. you get a new pathway of calming strategies. Or you can have a mere calming. Cat habit which is quite mm -hmm. you know an anger habit or to that next level of sort of changing your habits around and also I suppose the elephant brain the hippocampus I refer to it as a filing cabinet and we keep opening the same drawer over and over again 
and mm-hmm. he's telling the meerkat scary stories and getting each other worked up. Whereas I want him to have a different drawer and work with the owl. So it's a sensible drawer full of all my strategies and things I can do. So you can train your elephant and fill your drawer with your helpful strategies. And then they automatically go for the helpful strategies. Mm-hmm. Which gives parents language of going, which drawer are you going for today? Mm-hmm. That types of things. And that can change the way we we as the adults approach it. The child will be the child will be the child. They'll mm-hmm. do their child things. Yeah. For whatever reason that's going on in their brain and their head. But what we've got is an arsenal of language to respond to it, to bring them back to previous learning. Thank you. Um, Pauline, before before we finish, um, so I am, with the recording, I'll post links. Can I post a link to your Facebook group? Because can anyone join that Facebook group? Yep, yep, it's open to anyone. Yeah. Just follow the rules and behave, then we're fine. <laughs> Summer, summer's just hit. Oh, <laughs> summer's <on> like... <laughs> window. Yeah. Um, okay, so I'll post, I'll post links to that and then people can get in touch with you as well, can't they? If they... Yeah, absolutely. Yeah um is there any anything that we haven't talked about that you were wanting to mention a little list of things no I don't think so I mean yeah I mean the only other thing I had up there that parents often bring to me was school refusing but it kind of sits under the same language same things as I was saying Mm -hmm. because is it refusing or is it a proper choice that school's not for them or is it us not uh, you know a kid not knowing how to go through a discomfort emotion because sometimes school is tricky so that was the only other thing I had on my list but it well, can, of... we, can we talk about that for five minutes yeah. I... I mean because it's relevant to you as well um and you, you you've gone through a journey with that and I, the first thing I suppose I hate is the term school refuser mm-hmm it's it's a it's a terrible free a phrase because some children if we know that emotions drive behaviors then they can't go to school. Do you know that they, they, there's some reason in their life that school is not their time, play, their place at this time in their life. Mm-hmm. And parents will, but that word school refuser is really a label that can prophecy set mm-hmm. some children. It can obviously of, often prophecy set for their future. Mm-hmm. And they then they become, their identity becomes a school refuser rather than someone who's struggling just now and school's not their place or someone that maybe needs some encouragement to get back into school. Now, I have led many children from care systems to, you know, kids living with adversity called a build-up plan and we built our way back into school with successes and mm-hmm. the, aim, the goal was always you will be back in school because that's where it's best for you right now. Mm-hmm. So the kids at the other end need to be at home or homeschooled or, you know, in a different environment. And there's a whole spectrum there. But my ones that I usually worked with, I felt like that label gave them an identity and they became a bigger school refuser rather than, so school's not right for you right now, but can we create a build-up timetable so you can get yourself back into that society? Yeah, something um I saw yesterday, actually, was that... what um. And I wish I could attribute it to the correct person, and I can't. But um, that when ch- if if a child told a teacher at school that they don't feel safe at home, yeah, that would become a safeguarding issue. Yeah. Yet these children that don't want to go to school do not feel safe in school, yeah. and then they're expected to Absolutely. go anyway. Go and anyway. When I saw <laughs> that like that. I was like, wow. Oh, we don't want our kids to be unsafe. And I think that's our work as the teachers or the practitioners in school is are they just using the word safe because they can't think of any other word because they find it uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. So like unpicking them there. But yeah, I mean, if they're feeling unsafe, it's like which parts and how can we make you feel safe? Mm -hmm. Because my job was always in school is like you need to feel safe. These kids need to feel safe because if not, then their meerkat's not learning Mm because if their meerkat feels unsafe, and most of it was attributed to behaviour. Now we go, it's not behaviour. Their meerkat's feeling unsafe for some reason. So what can we do to make them feel safe? And that should be the biggest. On that build-up timetable I used to do with a lot of young people, it was to go into safe subjects or with safe people to increase their feelings of safety. Not so that I could then shove them in with Mr. Whoever who made them feel unsafe, but to then I felt able to speak to their owl to go, what's making you feel unsafe in maths? Is it the subject? Is it the teacher? Is it the pupils? Mm -hmm. But until I could talk to their owl, 
Mm -hmm. I wasn't getting anywhere. So my build up timetable was always to go to safe places first, even if it was a library or a, you know, music, because it was their favorite thing. Mm -hmm. We would build that safety up rather than, yeah, you're right. I'm never ignoring a kid's feelings of unsafe, but you would say, well, let's go to places that are safe. And then we would build that timetable and then it, it was amazing because we'd have kids on full-time timetables. I didn't say do it overnight. Mm -hmm. We didn't put a timescale on it because we were calming the meerkat until they were ready. But I never wanted them to lose their identity of... I worked in services for a long time where kids would have been excluded or at risk of exclusion or away, away. Mm -hmm. Just nobody really could remember why, but they were away. And I would say to kids, so which school do you belong to? Because they should always belong to their school. Mm -hmm. no, I don't belong to any of them so they'd lost their identity mm -hmm. so how are we ever going to get them back whereas that's their school and there should always be a connection and it might be small it might just be going to one thing they find safe mm -hmm. until we can find two things they find safe and then change their vision of safety as well so I guess what's coming up for me when you say that um it's my ex you know from my experience of um yeah, working with lots of different families, yes. is that that's okay if the school's willing to work with the family. Um, and what I found more and more is it's the little things that help the child feel happy or safe. Yeah, but look. sometimes schools are not willing to give, and it can be something like sitting next to a friend, yep. and the school can just have like um almost like a blanket policy where they don't, they sit like in a certain way but actually not accommodating something like that can be the difference to attending yeah. school or not um suppose it's why I'm sitting here with my own business rather than trying to do that <laughs> because you're absolutely right I would find the most amazing teachers and it'd be somebody quite random you know some biology teacher away up in the corner and I would say he says this is the place he wants to come to so if something you're doing in your class is making him feel safe and he'd go Perfect. And he'll go, I'll send some work home for you. Make sure he's all up to speed. And then we'll gradually bring him into class. Mm -hmm. And he says, you can be there. But I used to be there sometimes, but I wasn't there. I was just mm -hmm. there. And it'd be brilliant. And then it, the kid would feel safe enough to have their hour conversation and go, I think I could go to PE because I love the PE teacher or I like the, whatever, mm -hmm. the safe aspects because I've now got him to talk about safe. Now I get that some kids not got those, that, huge amount of language so we'd have to figure that out with them but mm -hmm. I've done it for quite a range of children but yes I had to find those individual teachers that were willing to shift a little bit yeah so it's like step one is working out with the child what what they need and, and what's difficult and then the school need to then work with you with you don't unpick, they? and unpick the word safe because yeah. that's a scary word maybe it's just uncomfortable Mm -hmm. Sometimes I'm uncomfortable, you know, in maths because I'm no good at maths. Yeah. And that's, that's fine. But we teach them to work through some discomforts, not extreme, but normal discomforts. Mm -hmm. and then that's a life skill in itself, isn't it? And I go, yeah, math is a struggle for me as well. But let's go along because Mrs. Such and Such, you know, whatever, is a great teacher. And we're going to try to work through the discomfort. Mm -hmm. Not pain, but discomfort. Okay. So I'm trying to change Again. the child's view. Yeah, two, two other things, if that's all right. Um, so something I found with one of my own children, but other children as well, um, and it's not so much a question, I'm just interested in, in, you know, sharing this and seeing what you think. When I was at school myself, I don't remember ever wondering the relevance of it. I just, I just went and it was just what we did. I'm finding, and I think it's partly like the YouTube and the internet, children are like questioning the relevance I also think it's like um almost like an outdated curriculum that you know in the real world there's you know bitcoin and like all these things and then the curriculum is not does not match up not and but I know my son he you know he he could be easily he could be an entrepreneur he could set up his own business probably from age 14 you know he's he's intelligent and he's driven and he's then wondering what's the point you know so when he's then not enjoying school he's sensitive he's like you know he he thinks well what's the point to this have you found that more and more with like you I, I do and especially um you know adolescents as well because our adolescents are are slightly different now which is great because i love it um but they're more 
and they always have been, but it was always blamed on hormones before. But our adolescents are going through this whole process, which is why I'm, I'm, I think it's great to give them their place and we have to listen to them because, you know, there are kids. But also their prefrontal cortex is going through this whole pruning process. So they can't really make big decisions. So I suppose school was this place that made decisions for them for a while. Mm-hmm. But they are fight button against it, maybe rightly so, because sometimes it's a bit boring. Mm-hmm. Um, but yes, our fourteen year olds probably could be entrepreneurs in some ways, but they've also got that impulsive. You know that when they want to, yeah. I don't know, dr- drive. Well, it's when I suppose drink and drugs and these types of things. Some of us have done over our lifetimes. We did them during our adolescence because our wee owl was offline because he was going through this pruning process, and who was in charge? Mm-hmm. during the, this he's more in charge during adolescence which is why I suppose school's been set up in that way to guide kids through their adolescence mm-hmm. you know they're wiser now and they're challenging that and I'm not sure it's going quite as well as it should because school should have time and energy to adjust they haven't had time and energy to adjust mm-hmm. they're still teaching the old stuff and holding these kids 14 you know 15 and yet they're going through that pruning pruning process right up until they're 26 mm-hmm. but therefore do we let them run off and go wild mm-hmm. with little your cats we're trying to keep them penned in in a sort of school environment because that's their safe place supposed to be but right now it's not feeling like it for them because they want out I can't help but think the word partnership comes to mind that more of a partnership between adults and young people like yeah yep. more collaboration so yeah Mm. Yeah, there absolutely should be. And we know we're not I'm not going to sit here and criticize teachers. You know, it was a hard gig for 25 years. But I, and even all the strikes and things recently and stuff like that, it's not given them even space and energy to go, how do we get into partnership with our kids? Because there'll be some amazing people there. There'll be some old jaded ones that really just don't want to change. But like any workplace, there'll be some amazing ones that want to change. But how do you change? Mm-hmm. I couldn't change when I was a young teacher. I knew all this was right, but it took me a lot of years and a lot of energy to go, I can't do this anymore. You yeah, know, I think it's so important to be clear that, that like, any criticism is oh, the system. Oh, it's it's the, the system. system. It's the not system. the individuals in the system. And I think people, most people know that, do they? It's yeah. the system that's broken because that individual teacher you'll meet at a meeting is amazing and says all the right things, but never has time to implement some of them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's hard, but I think as well, yeah, back to your question really, is that can we leave 14-year-olds in charge of their own destiny? We would love to, but we always need to be behind them, scaffolding them, because... Right. Yeah, that's to, really helpful, yeah. We're going through a little bit of this, so we say, right, well, that's fine. Your owl's not really working right now, and this is kind of what's happened. As parents, we haven't used this language, but we're saying, I'm your owl right now, because it's not working right now. You know, I probably, my mum would have said that to me many years ago had she known about the owl, but what mm-hmm. she did instead was grounded me because right. that we didn't really know any different because I was going through my meerkat years where meerkat mm-hmm. was in charge. Our mums grounded us. Mm-hmm. Things have changed, yeah. but the meerkat's still alive and well in our teenagers. So that's when they make impulsive decisions and we need to be their owl for them for a, for a mm-hmm. good part of the time. Oh, I can see how you could be really helpful supporting a family that are going through that tricky teenage stage and helping the pet. You know, when the teenagers hate the parents, you know, that, yeah, that would be. Actually, that's just a meerkat, extra large. (laughs) Yeah. Extra large meerkat, because there's no real owl. There's no real owl going around at this point, because it's actually been chopped out for a very good reason, to Mm -hmm. create space for Mm -hmm. adults. But it it is happening. So the the last thing I had um, was... Um, a, my son experienced what I would call burnout and a lot of families I work with have children um, in, in burnout um, and what I found myself and with the families is some of I imagine your suggestions and my suggestions they don't work in burnout like to me burnout is about recovery and um, my son spent about five months m- not literally every day but almost not getting dressed curtains shot watching youtube and he needed he needed to recover um and then we could start using strategies and getting somewhere is that i mean what's your take on burnout and i mean i mean you you've lived it do you know that mm-hmm. you lived it i meet a lot of kids on burnout um i think mostly i think mostly the ones i did work with quite 
primarily it was uh, working with kids in the care system. They mm -hmm. were burnt out. You know, their life had just been absolutely fried. And I think you're right. It's that nurturing. But all the way along, I was quite... Um, we have to be nurturing in that not soft and fluffy sense because I think I suppose that's what I did when I worked with the young people in the units in our you know young persons units that were away from home and they were burnt out and they couldn't go to school but we'd be forcing them to go to school because the system says you've got to go to school and I'd say well they need to we need to um nurture them not in the pun not in the permissive sense mm -hmm. um and not in a punitive sense and that's what kind of happens sometimes in that in, in sort of education care system world and I said I mean I'm assuming in parent and world as well because when we don't know what to do mm -hmm. Our old programming is to go punitive and make our kids do things or give them rouse or take things away from them, their mm -hmm. Xboxes and their Playstations and their phones. Mm -hmm. Or we kind of go, I don't know what to do, and we go soft and fluffy. Mm -hmm. Both of these things trigger our meerkats. Okay. Punitive, it's like, don't you dare take my Xbox away or my phone away. Permissive, is like, where's my strong person? Where mm -hmm. are they? Where are, yeah, where are my boundaries? Like, where, yeah, I need that strong person because there's nobody looking after me. But often we go down a permissive route because we're like, poor soul. Because your son, Evans, has been awful. Do you know that your poor mm -hmm. son isn't burned out and you know it physically, mentally, and everything else? Mm -hmm. But he needs those boundaries and things and that middle zone, doesn't he? And, that, mm -hmm. and I call it the positive because it's three Ps and it works nicely. Punitive, permissive, don't support the meerkat. But those. Puni permit sorry positive things the middle part is probably exactly what you did because mm -hmm. you had structure and routines and maybe one thing you needed them to do each day to sort yes. of challenge yourself mm -hmm. it might not have been getting dressed but you're thinking well we're gonna do this thing today and put it on a timetable so he's prepared for it and stuff mm -hmm. you yeah. are going to do that thing today and you're going to put your energy into that one thing Mm -hmm. not going punitive not permissive and go well it doesn't matter if you don't fancy it it's more a kind of we're doing this one thing a day or mm -hmm. two times a week whatever people decide yeah do that with the young people that were burnt out and I would say well we are going to get up this morning and we are going to go to you know whatever head for our or make our breakfast mm -hmm. and then were they fancy and going to school were they not that was still a choice that was still an option because they were in burnout mm -hmm. Protecting always there they still had an identity um and as families that would be you know the, the similar choices replaced but it's that one thing because i think we have to stay positive for their meerkat mm -hmm. and we are there i will until they can make decisions for themselves yeah that's going to be so helpful for a lot of families that i work with pauline i'm, I'm so grateful this has really got me thinking and i know it, it's going to get a lot of the other families i work with thinking as well so thank you you're welcome. Absolutely welcome. All right. I'm going to stop the recording.